Hello programmers, this is part three of the discussion that covers the topic of inheritance as used by C++ classes and objects. If you have not already seen parts one and two yet, I recommend watching them first. They provide an introduction to objects and classes and encapsulation. Part four is in a separate discussion and covers polymorphism. If you are watching this as a video, links to the other parts of the discussion should be available in the comments section on YouTube. My Amazon business is growing. I am ready to start selling clothing as well as books. I'm going to start with shirts and pants, and I need to upgrade the way to organize the inventory data. I already have a class for books. Now I need something for shirts and pants. I created additional class definitions, class shirt and class pants. The field type in the class shirt could identify if it is a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt, a blouse, etc. The field type in class pants could be used to identify dress pants, jeans, shorts, slacks, etc. I realize that in the real world more information may need to be added, but for the discussion this is what I am providing. I also need to write the code for the methods to process each field in each of the classes. One of the things that I noticed is that there is some duplication of fields. Every one of them has a field for price and in stock to make it easier to keep track of the inventory and make it easier to order things. I also want to add another field for everything and call it item ID. I would also need to duplicate any code in each class that references these fields such as methods for set item ID, get item ID, set price, get price, set in stock, get in stock. There needs to be a way of reducing the extra overhead to get things more organized. I am providing a base class, also sometimes called a super class. I'm naming my base class item 3. The only reason that the character 3 is part of the name is because I am in part 3 of the discussion. Class item has the fields for item ID, price, and in stock. Each of the other classes can inherit everything from class item and then just provide the additional fields that are needed. When I look even closer, I can see that the class definition for clothing items also share several fields such as the type of clothes, brand, and color. Here is an expanded diagram showing the relationship for class item, class book, class clothing, class shirt, and class pants. Thinking of this diagram as an upside down tree, item can be considered a root node and everything branches off of it. Clothing is a branch node, but book, shirt, and pants are all leaf nodes because they do not have any inherited subclasses derived from them. Because book is a derived from item, it actually includes item ID, price, in stock, title, author, and date. Shirt is derived from clothing, which is derived from item, so it includes item ID, price, in stock, type, brand, color, and size. See how the items for shirt and pants are unique? These two classes can inherit everything from class clothing and class item. They just need to include some member data of their own that relates to size for shirt and length and waist for pants. Although class book is only declaring variables for title, author, it also inherits item ID, price, and in stock from class item. Class shirt only declares one variable named size, but it inherits brand and color from class clothing, which inherits item ID, price, and in stock from class item. Item 3 is a base class, also known as a super class or a parent class. Book 3 is inherited from item 3. It is also known as a derived class or a subclass to item 3. Book 3 is also a leaf node because it does not have any classes inherited from it. Clothing 3 is a derived class. It is inherited from item 3. Shirt 3 and pants 3 are inherited from clothing 3 and are leaf nodes. Each arrow represents an is a relationship. We could say that books is an item or shirt 
is a clothing and is an item. A class can have many derived classes inherited from it. In C++, a class can only have one direct base class. In C++, there are three access specifiers. Public, members are accessible from outside the class. Private, members can only be accessed by the class in which they are defined. Protected, members can be accessed by the class in which they are defined and any subclasses derived from it. Member data or member methods with the public access specifier can be accessed by any subclass or anywhere in the program where the object is visible. For example, if an object is instantiated in main, anything with public access specifier can be accessed in main. Access can only go up from a derived class to its base class. Access cannot go down from a base class to one of its inherited subclasses. And access cannot go across from one subclass to another subclass. Although the protected access specifier is common in most object-oriented programming languages, some people say it should not be used for a couple of reasons. If any changes occur to the base class's protected member data, this could affect any class derived from it. The goal in OOP is derived classes should not be affected if the base class is updated. Some people feel that this is giving too much power to the derived classes. This may be a philosophical argument, but since protected access specifiers are part of OOP, I am using them here. People who are against protected access argue that the base class's data should be accessed through getters and setters instead of accessing the protected data directly. Now, let's see how this is implemented in C++. Here is a list of files that make up the project in Visual Studio. Each file name includes the character 3 only because I'm in part 3 of the discussion on classes and objects. Since files are being updated as the discussion progresses, I don't want to accidentally use the code for Book 2 from Part 2 when I'm working with Part 3. When I am totally finished with the project, I won't use numeric identifiers on any of the file names. The left pane shows a list of the header files and implementation files. Even though there are files for pants 3h and pants 3.cpp, no code is in them. They are considered stubs, meaning that they are just placeholders for now. I am leaving it up to you to complete the coding and testing for those two files, even when the project is finally completed. The right pane shows the first part of the book 3 test.cpp file. It contains an array filled with Book 3 objects and an array of Shirt 3 objects. The two separate arrays are used because every element in an array must be the same data type. I can't put a Shirt 3 object in an array whose data type is Book 3. Item 3 is the base class for this project for everything that I am going to be selling on Denizon. It has three data members item ID, price, in stock, and the function prototypes for the constructors, getters, and setters. Subclasses that are derived from item 3 class no longer need to declare these member data variables or getters and setters that access them. The getters and setters have public access that can be used by main or any program that instantiates objects derived from the item 3 base class. The getters and setters can also be accessed by any of the derived classes. The data members, item ID, price, and in stock have protected access. Only subclasses that are derived from item 3 class can access those things that are declared protected. The constructors for item 3 also have protected access. That means that subclasses of item 3 can access them, but they can't be accessed by main. An object of class 3 item would not be very useful, and I didn't want an object instantiated, so I made the constructors protected. The book 3 constructors, getters, and setters are public. 
clothing 3 is also derived from item 3. In my mind, it is still too generic to sell a piece of clothing without knowing more about it. Therefore, I'm giving the constructors protected access to prevent a clothing class from being instantiated from main, but still allow it to be used as a parent class for real pieces of clothing such as shirts and pants. The member data type, brand, and color are also protected, but the getters and setters are public so that they can be accessed by the main program. In order to make Bug3 inherited from the base class item, there are a few updates that need to be made to the Bug2 code from the previous version of the program. Looking at the class definition in Bug3.h, I see the following. One, I need pound include quote item 3.h quote, which defines the base class for Bug3. Double quotes are used around the file name because the file is located in the project directory instead of the compiler's include directory. Two, the class is declared as class book three colon public item three, which not only names the class book three, but also identifies its base class item three. Only title and author variables are declared here. The item ID, price, and in stock variables will be inherited from the item 3 base class. We only need setters and getters for title and author. We only need setters and getters for title and author. The setters and getters for item ID, price, and in stock are inherited from item 3. I'm adding a two string method which can be used in main to display all the meaningful info about an object without needing to reference each piece of member data using getter methods. Here is the book3.cpp file that contains the code to implement the book3 class. It starts off with pound include quote book3.h quote. There are some more pound include statements. Pound include string because there are string variables. Pound include ss stream and pound include io manip have been added because later in this file I'm providing the code for the toString method which will create a C++ string that describes the contents of a book 3 object. I will show how this can be used in the main program to display an object's contents. The no argument constructor starts with the book 3 colon colon book 3 open close parentheses to identify the class name, the colon colon scope resolution operator, and book 3, the same name as the class to identify that it is a constructor method. It just calls the five argument constructor with the values of empty strings and zeros for numeric values. The five argument constructor receives the item ID title, author, price, and stock arguments. Inside the body of the constructor, setter methods are used to initialize the title and author variables which are defined in class book 3. The other variables, item ID, price, and in stock are located in the base class named item 3 and need to be initialized by the item 3 constructor. Looking back at the declaration for the five argument constructor, we can see it ends with colon item 3 open parentheses item ID comma price comma in stock closed parentheses. When an object is instantiated these three pieces of data are passed from the book 3 5 argument constructor to the item 3 constructor to initialize items 3's private data. The code inside the to string method looks very much like something I would see when using C out. Instead of using C out to display directly to the system console, everything is going into a C++ string object. It is common for a to string method to be created for objects. This way, Parts of the program that instantiate a book 3 object, such as main in our example, can use the toString method in a cout statement to display the full information about an object as well as using the individual getter methods to display only selected information. Additional information about calling the toString method when the book 3 test.cpp file is discussed in more detail. 
Class Clothing 3 is similar to Class Book. They're both derived from Class Item 3. Clothing 3 uses the protected access specifier for its member data for variable type, brand, and color, and public access specifier for getters and setters. Protected access specifiers provided for the constructors because I don't want any objects derived from class clothing, but only from its subclasses. Also, I did not provide a two-string method. If I need one when I do the polymorphism, I will add it later. The code that implements the Clothing 3 class is similar to the code that implements the Book 3 class. I didn't need the pound include SS stream or pound include I'll minip statements because I'm not providing the to string method at this time. The sex argument constructor also calls the base class item 3 constructor to initialize item ID, price, and in stock because those variables are located in item 3 class definition. I was running out of room when typing, so I placed the colon and the call to base class item 3 on the next line. The shirt 3 class is similar to the book 3 class, but it is derived from clothing 3 class instead of item 3. It only has one member data named size and getters and setters for size. Since this is also a leaf node, I am providing a toString method. Shirt3.cpp implements the code for Shirt3 class. It is similar to the code for Book3 and includes the toString method. I have not written any of the code for Pants3.h or Pants3.cpp because I am leaving them to you. These two files should be similar to the equivalent files for Shirt3, except instead of a single member or variable named size, you need to provide two variables, length and width. You also need to provide getters and setters for them and provide a toString member function. Create an array of pants and main and test it to verify that it works correctly. Here is the output of the Book 3 test program. The first part of the display is the for loops that use the toString method. The second part is from the for loops that use getters to display only the item ID and title for the books and the item ID type and brand and size for the shirts. The code in main has the option of how to display and how much of the data it wants to display from the objects. Main doesn't need to know much about how an object is organized when using the toString method, but the other way it really needs to know the names of the getter methods so that it may be different for each object. So far in the program this is working out okay. We are able to use a for loop to first display books in the book list array and then use another for loop to display shirts in the shirt list array. More code could be provided for pants. I suppose when I run my program I could ask the user to first decide if they want to look at books, shirts, or pants. But when it came time to build the shopping cart, I would also need to use three different arrays for shopping carts because each element in an array must have the same data type. If I had 20 different types of items, I would need 20 arrays, one for each item type. I would also need 20 shopping cart arrays. This not only becomes unwieldy to program, but also presents a lousy customer experience. What I really want is one array that holds the inventory for all the different items I want to sell. I also want only one shopping cart that holds different items. Dandolph and Object Oriented Programming's Polymorphism to the Rescue! One array to rule them all! By implementing polymorphism with inheritance, I will be able to create arrays from the base class item and put any object in those arrays that are derived from class item. 
this is the end of the C++ OOP discussion that covers inheritance and the two-string method. Stay tuned for the next exciting chapter, Polymorphism, on a video coming to you soon.